Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first educational program of the season. Um, we're excited to have you joining us today. We're even more excited to have Dr. Jessica Rohr with us. Um, my name's Peggy Datermeyer. I am the uh, McGee Fellow and the Director of CARES at the Hope and Healing Center. CARES is an acronym for Caring, Aging, Resilience, Ethics, and Spirituality. Um, that has very little to do with talking about mental health with kids, but I have also inherited the educational program management. So I am hosting today. I will be watching the um, questions. I invite you to post your questions in the chat box. If you look either at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on how your um, screen is set up. Um, and if you have, if there are any of you who need um, CEUs for family, uh, family therapy, um, social workers, those kinds of uh, functions, um, I'm also going to put my email address in the chat box and please um, shoot me an email at the end of the presentation. And you can uh, email me tomorrow and, or this afternoon or tomorrow, and I will send you information um, on how to do that. As I said, we are very uh, excited today to have Dr. Jessica Gore join us. She is the uh, Director of Women's Mental Health at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Houston Methodist, as well as a st staff psychologist at the Emotional Health and Wellbeing Clinic at Houston Methodist. So without further ado, I am going to turn the program over to her. As I said, uh, write your questions in the chat box and I'll be keeping an eye and uh, Dr. Moore will give us about 10 minutes at the end of the program and try to answer all your questions. Um, I'm going to turn my mute myself and um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much. And I am so excited to be here to talk about this. This is one of my, my favorite things to talk about. Um, I think this is so useful for all of us um, as parents, as people, as partners. And um, it's, I, I, I work with primarily women, primarily moms. And as I like to say to people I work with, I am not above using their love for their children to get them to treat themselves better. So um, that's how I kind of came up with this topic. But let's get into it so that we have time for questions. And I tend to overload my presentations because I think I have a hard time with weeding stuff out. I think it's really fun. So talking about mental health with kids. Brief overview, I'm just gonna kind of just define mental health uh, the way that I'm thinking about it today and talk about why it's important. Um, how can talking about emotions help? Why are, why are emotions related to mental health? I'm gonna talk about calling someone emotional um, and then give you a brief overview of what emotion coaching is. Um, and we'll do a little brief practice with an example from my life with my kids and I'll give you some resources at the end. So mental health in a nutshell, um, how we feel, how we think, and how we act because of those. So this is gonna be our emotional well-being, our psychological well-being, social well-being. It helps determine how we handle stress, how we relate to other people, what choices we make. It's important at every stage of life from childhood all the way up through adulthood. So why is this important to us right now? Well, it's been a rough time. And our research is showing that about 25% of kids have elevated levels of depression, um, one in four. So if you can think four children, one of them probably has higher depression than the others. And then they used to before a few years ago. One in five kids have elevated levels of anxiety. And we aren't doing great either. So among adults, prevalence of depression at least tripled and prevalence of anxiety disorders doubled during COVID. So this is important right now because it is all around us. This would be the same as if I were giving a conversation about a, a presentation about COVID at the beginning of COVID. This is, this is a lot of people say that the next pandemic is going to be a mental health pandemic. 
So how will talking about emotions help? How is that in any way related to these mental health issues, depression, anxiety? Well, we have decades of research that suggests that being able to talk about emotions well uh, can improve your mental health. Um, it can actually reduce the number of negative and increase the number of positive emotions. And people have less stress when they are better able to talk about emotions as measured by stress hormones, as measured by resting heart rate, by actual physiological measures of distress and stress. Um, people are also in better physical health when they have high emotional intelligence, which is being able to talk about emotions well. Um, they don't get sick as quickly or as, as, as easily. Um, and like I said before, the resting heart rate is better, which is a, another indicator of physical health. They have better social skills, um, higher social confidence. Uh, they get along better with their friends when they can talk about emotions. We do. We do better academically. And uh, there are fewer behavior problems in adolescents and adulthood and people who can talk about their emotions. So I'm going to talk about what it means to call someone emotional. And the thing is, everyone is emotional. So I don't know how many people have been called emotional at some point in their life. I know I have been. And I think it's important to kind of get everyone on the same page here that everyone has emotions. Everyone is emotional. I like to talk about emotions in these four pieces. So we have vulnerability to emotions, awareness of emotions, labeling emotions, and expression of emotions. And I'm going to be asking you how you think about this for yourself. And if you're, you're sitting there saying, wait, 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 I thought we were going to be talking about kids today. The problem here, not the problem, but the important thing to know is that the way that you understand and process emotions is going to be the same way that your children learn how to do it. And it's the same way that your parents did it for you. Parents and eventually other role models, other people that you were around that you saw have emotions. So. Again, I'm going to be asking you to think about how these emotions show up for you, because that's going to be really important for being able to do this with your kids. So we're going to go through these stages of emotions. Um, these first, the first place that I like to think about emotions is vulnerability to emotions. So as you can imagine from the title, and again, people are going to vary and where they fall on each of these dimensions. And I'm gonna be asking you as I talk through these to think about where do you fall on these? So vulnerability to emotions, my answer's not working. There. A lot of times what I'll talk about with my patients is that everybody's just like you have your physical nerves in your body, everybody's got emotional nerves. And sometimes your nerves are just a little bit closer to the surface. Everybody's sensitive in different ways to the experience of these emotions. And this can vary based on several factors. So one is just biology. Some people are born with a biological sensitivity to emotions. Um, this is going to be your child who cried a lot more easily than, you know, my, my first child was a big crier when she was born. It was very hard to soothe her. She was very um, reactive and responsive to, you know, changes in the environment. And my second child, not so much. And that was from birth. And so I know that my first child probably has a slightly higher vulnerability to emotions, just biologically. And that can also be, um, there's a genetic heritability there. So what that means is you probably have, a, if, if you are, or a sibling is, you probably have a parent that might be as well. Another thing that can make you more vulnerable to emotions is what you experienced while growing up. Um, so we talk a lot about um, you know, if you think about nature versus nurture or um, gene environment interaction, or there's all these different ways that we talk about it. But basically, we've got biological factors and then development factors. And when you grow up, those, the things that you experienced, whether they were traumas, whether they were difficult experiences, whether they were lovely experiences, all of those can make your emotional nerves closer to or further away from the surface. And then there, <laughs> your, your emotional nerves can help be closer to the surface based on what you experience just that very day. So let's talk about basically what I'm talking about here is a context for the experience of these emotions. So the long ago context can be um, things that happened a long time ago, or the context can be things that happened that day that make you more vulnerable. And so 
these contexts will lead to different levels of vulnerability. We're not really used to thinking about these, and, and there, there can be some ways of coping that people talk about that actually encourage us to ignore these, um, these pieces of context. And I think that it can actually be really helpful to acknowledge, for instance, my context today, um, I didn't sleep great last night. And so I can know that my emotional nerves will probably be a little closer to the surface today. That doesn't mean that I can act any way I want to act. And it doesn't invalidate my emotions. It just means I can understand what's happening in my body if I'm having stronger emotions to things than I usually do. So understanding our personal vulnerability to emotions and kind of learning how that might be for your kids is going to be really helpful. So that's one piece, your vulnerability to emotions. Another, you know, if anybody was ever called sensitive growing up, you may be somebody that was a little bit more vulnerable to emotions. That's usually, that's usually a good tell for me. The second piece is how aware we are of our emotions. And again, everybody differs on how aware they are of their emotions. And there are some different things that help, help, con help contribute to these natural variations in awareness of emotions. And so when I say awareness, I mean, Literally, do you understand or notice when an emotion is occurring in your body? I, I, I like to think about emotions as another sense, a sixth sense. Um, we smell things, we see things, we hear things. We interpret what we have smelled or heard or seen through whatever knowledge base that we have, memories, things like that. And then we kind of determine some sort of um, reaction to it. It's the same with emotions. Um, we, we, something occurs, we sense something, and then we decide how to interpret that. Some people, for different reasons, have varying levels of how aware they are when they're actually having an emotion. And you may notice this. You may, you may be somebody who notices when your partner is acting differently. Maybe they're, they're quieter than usual, or your child seems a little bit down, or maybe snappy. And then you ask them, you know, what's going on? And they say, oh, nothing. I don't, I don't think anything's going on at all, but but you can tell something's happening. So there's an awareness there um, or a difference in awareness of emotions when they're happening. And again, some, some of these are just natural variations and kind of ability to notice those changes in the body, the changes in the heart rate, the changes in, in how that makes somebody feel. Um, it's going to be just purely biological. And some of it is related to how you've dealt with emotions throughout your history. So for people who have experienced trauma, many people use dissociation as a way to deal with trauma. Dissociation refers to kind of shutting down in the face of trauma. And when somebody uses that in the moment, it can be really effective in the moment to help you get through. But if then you learn, oh, wow, that was a really great coping skill. I'm going to keep using that. Um, that can slowly eat away at how aware you become of your emotions if you tend to just shut down anytime you have one. And then the way that your emotional expression was handled growing up also can have an impact on your awareness of emotions. And we'll spend some time on this later. But emotional expression, um, it, the more you talk about something and the more that it's welcomed for that to be talked about, the more awareness and comfort you're going to have with those. And if those emotions aren't welcomed, then you're going to start to kind of put them away and they're going to seem like they're not that important to you. Another thing that can happen here. Sometimes people go years without noticing they have emotions. Sometimes you'll be, this may either be you or somebody you're in a relationship with, somebody who's so used to pushing down emotions, not noticing them, not being aware of them, that you don't really notice them until they explode and come out in a very, very big way. So again, just kind of learning, is it you? Um, where do you fall on vulnerability, on awareness? And what about your kids? Where do they fall? And where did that come from? Our third piece here is labeling emotions. I think people, out of all of these, I, I would imagine that people have heard the most about these last two bits, labeling emotions and express, expressing emotions. When it comes to emotion regulation, learning what to do with emotions, I know there's a lot of conversation about you need to learn how to put a word to the emotions. It's so important to put a word to the emotions. And it feels like a very small thing to put a label to emotions. And so I wanted to, I have an analogy that I really like um, when thinking about why is it so important to be able to label something correctly to be able to know how to move on from it and deal with it appropriately. So just imagine you're walking out in your backyard or in kind of a grassy area, you don't have shoes on 
and you step on something sharp. And there is this moment, there's this, this amount of time between when you've stepped on it, there's this sharp pain in your foot, and when you turn your foot over to see, okay, what is this? That is a very uncomfortable, distressing moment of time. So just kind of think about what that feels like. You know, you're trying to quickly get somewhere where you can sit down and examine it, and all of these possibilities are going through your mind. All you know is it hurts. And there may be some anxiety about what it could be. Is this a, did I step on a yellow jacket? Is this a rusty nail? Am I going to have to get a tetanus shot? Is this just like a burr in the grass? Like there, there's going to be some anxiety about what's happening in your body and whether it's like reflective of actual damage. But then once you turn it over and you've labeled whatever it is that's causing this pain, do you have a better idea of what to do? Well, sure right? Even if it is the worst case scenario and wherever that may be for you, I mean, maybe it's a yellow jacket and you're allergic, then you know you've got to take some Benadryl. You might have to go to the to urgent care. And does the experience of pain change at all? And so this is, this is a little bit of a, for some people, maybe kind of a little bit of an out there idea that the experience of pain may actually change once you're able to appropriately label what's going on. But there is this idea that pain is a part of life, but we add to it we contribute to our suffering by struggling against that pain, by kind of fighting against it. And instead being able to label and accept what's happening can be really impactful for both just kind of organizing our experience, but also um, knowing what to do next. So labeling emotions is actually quite important and can be pretty difficult to do if it's something you're not familiar with. Um, we know that um, for men, a lot of times the easiest emotion to access and to label is anger. And um, for women, we tend to lean more towards emotions of self-evaluation. So uh, guilt, we do guilt a lot. Why feel guilty about that? So here's a feelings wheel I've used with um, some folks that I work with. Um, if any of you, if I could read any of your minds right now, then I imagine, um, wow, that's a lot that's coming to your mind. And so what I really encourage people to do with their kiddos is to keep it really simple. And this is my oldest. And so I asked her to help me with this. Um, we keep it simple and we keep it rhyming. So mad, bad, sad, and glad. Being able to label emotions with one of these is a great place to start to figure out what's going on. And especially with kids who um, may not have the full vocabulary that we are able to kind of connect with yet. Mad, bad, sad, and glad can be a really, really easy place to start. And this is something that they're learning through books, school, if they're in school, all of these anyway. So really kind of folding these into your vocabulary and even asking yourself sometimes when you're not feeling great, which of these does it fit? It's, it sometimes can be harder than we think. And this is also, you can start to learn some of the complexity of emotions, um, a little bit mad and a little bit sad, right? So helping us learn, or a little bit sad and glad, kind of referring to more of a bittersweet experience. So starting to learn for ourselves and also teach them that there are complex emotions. You can feel multiple different ways and that's okay. And finally, when we say, when somebody is calling someone else emotional, usually it's not in a super nice way. Usually they're referring to how they express their emotions, which I hope that I've demonstrated effectively. But that's really only one part of emotionality. Is, is It's really the end part. It's the part everybody else sees, right? It's the part other people have to actually deal with or tolerate. And so you can imagine that's why that's why that's the part that ends up getting attacked, is when other people have to tolerate the emotions. Sometimes it doesn't feel that good. So everybody, again, varies on the way that they express their emotions. And so what, what I want you to do is think about how your parents or caregivers growing up handled their emotional expression. And think about this in the context of cultural values, um, the way communities sort of embraced or did not embrace emotional experiences. Um, if you did go to church, whether that had an impact on the way that you saw emotions being handled. There are three general ways that I often see um, or to, that I often hear about emotions having been handled while growing up. So this is, again, thinking about your parents' emotions. And so one way is that emotions are dangerous and they're not the child's wisdom. And this is the idea that children should be protected from a parent's emotions. 
And where I see this a lot is parents who are going through difficult times. Maybe they're going through a divorce. They're having difficulties with money and they feel the need. They feel like they have to put on a quote unquote brave face for their child. Um, they can't share with their child that they're scared or worried or sad because they're worried that their child won't be able to handle it. Um, they want their child to believe that they are the biggest, strongest, wisest, and that they have everything under control. And this is, I mean, this is absolutely laudable. I mean, I, I think we all, um, for the parents in the room, I think we can understand the need and the desire to protect your child from these um, very difficult emotions. The problem here is that kids notice everything. Kids know when something's going on. Um, so this actually ends up with kids feeling invalidated and like they're not part of the family. Like they, they don't get to be included in these things. They start to question their own experience. Well, I just saw mom crying and I think she looks sad, but she's telling me everything is fine. So maybe I don't know what sad is. and Maybe I, I can't understand other people. And we know that part of emotional intelligence is, is learning how to do perspective taking with other people, kind of read their faces, guess about what that might mean. Um, and then you, it, they may feel lied to. There may be a little bit of feeling of mistrust rather than the security that we're so desperately hoping that they feel in that situation. And the reason that I think that people do this is because they have a really hard time understanding how to fit unpleasant emotions into a normal, pleasant relationship. And so this starts to kind of build this idea that relationships should only have positive emotions and unpleasant emotions should go away and be behind closed doors. Which again, I, I think is not what we want our children to, to learn or to know. We can understand how this, this hope for their security would lead to this, but it does end up um, with kids feeling a little bit left out. <clears throat> the other day I was, I was trying to make dinner and my daughter, she's four and a half. She just, you know, she's at that age. She's got a younger sister. So she's very, you know, she's high on the being the big kid and she wanted to help. And it was late already to start making dinner and I was exhausted, but I, you know, I tried to let her help. And she really wanted to wash her hands at the big sink. And so she asked me to drag her stool over. So I, and I said, okay. And it was just like that, nothing big. I didn't explode. I didn't, you know, fuss at her. I just, I said, okay. But I probably rolled my eyes a little bit. It was a little bit of a rude way to say it. And she turns around and looks and she goes, why did you say that a little bit meanly? And it just, I don't, it struck me that this tiny person who I think, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to always be really good about managing what she experiences and how I come across to her. And we have, you can imagine, she's an Arbor psychologist. We have very open emotional vocabulary. So it, it wasn't strange for her to call me out on that. And so I, you know, I said, I'm, I'm really tired. I'm sorry. I said that meanly, um, but she noticed she's four. And we have, there's research suggesting that kids as young as 18 months old can tell when something's not quite right with their parents. And so just imagine that feeling of knowing that something's off and being told it's fine. It's, it's an uncomfortable feeling. So anyway, I'm spending too much time on this one, but um, think through, is that what your parents did? Or was it more of this, that emotions happen? They're uncontrollable. Kids are responsible for doing what I tell them to do, not learning what I show them to do. So um, maybe somebody gets home and they are mad about something that happened at work and they're walking around slamming doors, um, calling their partner names, um, just because they're angry. And when you're angry, you can't really control it. You just gotta, you know, you gotta let it out. Um, the children may not be allowed to act that way. And so they start to kind of learn, okay, people in a position of authority can kind of do what they want. I'm supposed to do something different. And then they may actually additionally learn and I'm responsible for managing my parents' emotions. Um, sometimes the other partner can kind of unwillingly or unwittingly encourage this. You know, dad's getting home, everyone being really, really nice and happy and clean up real quick. So we're not, you know, we're not making them too mad. And so there's this sense of, you know, emotions just kind of happen and we all have to, we all have to um, adapt around it. And this can, this can lead to kids feeling kind of out of control, chaotic, again, feeling invalidated. Um, a, a big part of this, though, is it can teach children that they are responsible for other people's emotions, which is different from being responsible for making kind choices. 
um, there's a continuum there, right? We want to make kind choices, but we're not responsible for other people's emotions. And so when they, when these children grow up and get into relationships, and maybe this is you, you find yourself being much more concerned about someone else's emotions than your own, and maybe even better at naming someone else's emotions than your own, which gets us into trouble with our emotional intelligence and knowing what we need and how to get it. So a third way to handle emotional expression is that emotions are valued. Um, children benefit from observing appropriate emotional expression. All emotions are appropriate, not all expression is appropriate. Does that make sense? All emotions are valid, not all ways of expressing emotions are appropriate or acceptable. And so what this teaches kids is that negative feelings, conflict, they're normal and healthy relationships. I have conflict in my own brain by myself every day. So there's no reason why there should not be conflict in a relationship. Children can then watch how to express those feelings in a way that still maintains respect and love, right? Um, I'm really practicing this with my, with my partner and it's tough to be able to, to try to say, you hurt my feelings when you said that. And I wanna talk about that more. I'm not ready right now because I'm feeling really hurt. But we're trying to practice that. I mean, I, that may sound crazy, to, to do that rather than, you know, fighting behind closed doors. But there's two things happening there. One, it's being able to demonstrate how emotions are handled. And two, it's suggesting that conflict doesn't always have to be an argument. It doesn't always have to be a fight. One person can express emotions and the other person can choose how to respond to those. As you can imagine, I would like us to lean towards this last one. But again, the way that we handle emotions is very, very, um, impacted by the way that our parents or caregivers did. So just kind of think through what this looked like for you in your home growing up and what it may, what you may feel kind of pulled to do now in your own home with your kids. And sometimes there's a mix. So now think less about what your parents did with their emotions and more about how your emotional expression was handled growing up. So these are Gottman's um, four I'm going to show you four different types of emotional expression. Um, and Julie and John Gottman are um, very well respected ther uh, therapist scientists that have studied couples for decades and famously can predict with like 90% accuracy which couples are going to get divorced. So they have a lot of really great workshops and books on couples and basically they study relationships and so more recently they've been looking more into emotional intelligence and children and family relationships so that's where this comes from so one way to that your parents may have handled your emotional expression is to be dismissing and so this is you know negative feelings need to go away as quickly as possible um child starts crying um okay well you know take take some time and then come, come on back out when you're done crying. So this is a focus on reducing the expression of emotions. And remember, I showed you the four pieces of emotions. This does nothing for the rest of the, the parts of emotions. This is just reducing the emotional expression. And so this is kind of demonstrating, I, I don't wanna see this as a parent. I, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to tolerate it. I just need it to go away as quickly as possible. Disapproving has the same focus but the expression of emotions is more judged and criticized. So rather than just dismissing like, oh, I know you feel sad, you'll get over it, you'll be fine. It's more of, I can't believe you're crying about that. Um, I'll give you something to cry about. Um, do you know how many kids out there would feel so lucky that they got that? Um, it, there's a sense that the negative feelings were completely unproductive and needed to be controlled and again, not seen. This was a focus on reducing emotional expression. The third way is, is called laissez-faire. And so in this one, expression was freely accepted. The way that emotions come out is the way they come out. And there was, there's a sense with laissez-faire parents that the only thing that can really help with emotions is time. So it just needs to come out. So just let it out. Um, cry. You'll feel better tomorrow. Uh, no real assistance in labeling or managing the emotions. It's just get it out of your body. And then there's emotion coaching. And so this suggests that negative feelings may be unpleasant, but need to be tolerated and managed. 
And this has a focus on all of those bits of emotionality that we talked about already. So emotional labeling, emotional management, problem solving, um, even over time, emotion coaching can reduce your vulnerability to emotions and increase your awareness. And so again, this is the one I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, this is the one that is most consistent with improving mental health, physical health, emotional intelligence, family relationships, uh, self-esteem, academics, I can go on and on and on. Um, but this is what's gonna help get kids and us closer to being able to understand our emotions and what to do with them. These other three, um, often they, it, it's not that your parents or you are any one of these. A lot of times we kind of move in and out of them. Um, but again, it's kind of good to see like, what, what did my parents do? What have I picked up from them? What did I notice that they did and I didn't like it, but didn't quite know what to do instead? So we're gonna be focusing on emotion coaching. So again, just to really hammer it home, everyone's emotional. These are the four parts of emotions. 30 minutes in, let's say you're convinced <laughs> that emotion coaching is a good idea. <laughs> How do I do this? So I want to get some really basic assumptions in place. Striving for perfection is damaging. Repair is actually much more important than never messing up. And I'll say that again, striving for perfection is damaging. Repair is more important than not messing up. Nobody is perfect. You will mess up. Your children will mess up. Repair is one of the most important things you can do in a relationship. And it is one of the things that I see happening the least in relationships. People think that they need to do everything right the first time. And it's really hard to come back and repair. It's hard to know how to repair. And sometimes when you're the person who needs to be repaired with, it's hard to know what would help you repair. It's hard to know what would help you feel better. So teaching our kids from the very beginning about repair, not just, I'm sorry, Daniel Tiger talks about it. And I tell my husband this, I'm like, you know, if Daniel Tiger talks about it, you can, you, you can figure this out too. But it's not just, I'm sorry, it's I'm sorry, and how can I help? So Repair is actually really important. And that's, I bring this up with my with the people I work with a lot, my patients and my clients, that, that they'll say, you know, and then I yelled at my kid and I thought I'm just like my mom. And then I say, well, did you did you talk about it? Well, yeah, I apologize. I told him I was going to be hungry. I, sh I, I wish I hadn't taken it out on him next time I would do this. And I said, well, the, the fact that you yelled is, you're not just like your mom, you're just like everybody. I said, the, the fact that you're repaired is what makes you different from your parents. Um, so please, please remember that repair is extremely, extremely important and perfection. We're never going to meet it anyway. You want your kids to know that there's room for mistakes in a loving relationship because they are going to make them too. So they can't look at you and think perfect is the only way to be loved. We don't want them to think that. How much you love your child is unrelated to how well you deal with their emotions. I hope I've made that clear throughout the kind of the first half of this presentation, that the way that you deal with emotions is, is very, very much based in how you grew up, how what your biology looks like and what you learned. So it, I, again, what I really, what I hear a lot is I yelled at my kids and I feel so guilty because, you know, what, what is wrong with me as a mother that I'm, that I'm yelling at my kids or that I'm treating them or I'm invalidating them it has nothing to do with who you are as a mother or a father or how much you love them. Um, and I mean, the, the inverse is true, of course, if you were perfect at dealing with your emotions, it doesn't necessarily mean you love them. But I think what I deal with on a more regular basis is more of the opposite, is people feeling like they didn't do a great job with their emotions, and they feel this deep shame about who they are as a parent. And I, I just want to say there's not, there's absolutely no relationship between those. Emotion management is a skill, not a feeling. It is a skill, it's not a value. And emotional expression reflects safety and is an opportunity for intimacy and teaching. And I will say, this is hard to remember when your child is yelling at you and telling you it's the worst day ever because of some small thing that happened, especially when it's been a pretty good day otherwise. And, but it, so it's hard to remember that she's yelling at me because she feels safe. Emotional expression reflects safety. It means that that child thinks I can do this and my mom or my dad or my caregiver is not gonna leave because I'm having these emotions. Um, I think a lot of us can either think of times in our lives or friends' lives when they 
didn't feel that way, where they felt that they had to hide their emotions in order to maintain the sanctity or safety of the relationship. So when our kids are giving us really big emotions, remembering that that's because they feel safe, like I said, it can be really hard sometimes, but having that kind of basic assumption in there can be really helpful. And that's an opportunity for intimacy and teaching. When the emotions are biggest is when kids are at their most vulnerable. Us too. So these are the basic steps of emotion coaching. Number one, be aware of a child's emotions and of your own reactions to their emotions. This is not you as a therapist sitting there with, with your client. This is a family. This is a diet. This is your, you're working back and forth. Your emotions are feeding off of their emotions and vice versa. So understanding what theirs are and what yours are is really important. Number two, validate their feelings in words they can understand. So we're not going to say you're feeling, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really big word. You're feeling apprehensive about something. I'll say you're, you're feeling scared. Um, reinforce limits and boundaries is number three. Um, and then number four, problem solve with the child. I don't know a lot about gentle parenting. I'm, I'm going to admit that right now. I, I've leaned way more into kind of a attachment parenting literature, and I'll give you, give you all the information for that, um, things that have a ton of really good research behind them. Um, what I do hear a lot when one of the feedback, pieces of feedback I get a lot about emotion coaching is, well, this is that kind of namby-pamby millennial stuff about using emotion words. And I want to be really clear. We are still setting limits and boundaries here. Um, limits and boundaries are where children thrive. They are constantly asking us, who's in charge? Is it me, this a four-year-old, or is it you, a grown-up who owns this house? So us being able to reinforce limits and boundaries is what helps them feel safe and secure, that they are not in charge, that they are figuring this out and growing, and we are there helping to contain them as they go. And that's, again, where this emotion coaching can be really helpful, is we're helping to help them contain their emotions, get them away from this tangled mess and, like, line it up right, and then figure out what to do with them, figure out how to problem solve. We can't problem solve until we know what we're solving. So I'll give you all an example. Um, those of you who have, maybe not just young children, but children, know what a risk it is to purchase little Debbie items and bring them into the home. This is a, I, I know this, she's four and a half. I know this by now. She's going to find them. I don't care where I put them. We're going to find them. So we had a brownie pumpkin special time last night. We each ate a brownie pumpkin, had some milk. It was really nice. This morning she wakes up and she said, if I eat my yogurt and have some milk, can I have a brownie pumpkin? And I said, no, baby, we're not having brownie for breakfast today. Immediate screaming, screaming, slamming her tiny hands on the counter, stomping her feet, her baby sister sleeping upstairs. I hate this day and I want to kick you out and go live on an island. So I'm starting to feel pretty frustrated. Um, we had really nice brownie pumpkin time last night. We probably, I, I would give her one tonight and we just can't have one right now. Um, so I'm frustrated. It's 6.30 in the morning. I'm tired. The first thing I need to do is to kind of access what, what's happening here. What's happening for her? What's happening for me? Let me go through these emotion coaching steps. So number one, be aware of a child's emotions and my own reactions. Okay, so I can guess that she is probably feeling, she's hungry. It's first thing in the morning. She hasn't eaten yet. She's angry. She's confused. We had one last night. Why can't I have one today? Why are there different rules for nighttime and breakfast? Which honestly, I don't have a great answer for that. She's overwhelmed because these are a lot of feelings for a very tiny body to hold. Her feelings are hurt. I told her no, that hurts her feelings. And I'm feeling hungry, frustrated, a little anxious because I don't want the sister to wake up, kind of helpless because I don't really know what to do here, and tired. It's 6.30. I didn't sleep great. I said that already. I'm feeling tired. So we've done some feelings. I've named some feelings. I notice what I'm feeling. And I, I know that these feelings that I'm having are definitely going to make it a little harder for me to react in an appropriate way. If I was well-fed, well-slept, feeling great, I probably would have a lot easier time accessing whatever it is I need to access to emotion coach through this moment. So the next piece is to validate the child's feelings in words they can understand. Um, this is... 
voicing that you understand how they feel given the circumstances, not agreeing with the choice of expression. So remember what I talked about that before, emotions are valid, not all expressions are appropriate. Um, I can understand that you are feeling angry and sad because I'm not letting you have a brownie this morning. Um, even here, I didn't even say the validate part. I just named it. You're feeling really mad and sad because I'm not letting you have a brownie this morning. And so this is, you know, this is a really tough response for people who are used to reacting to their emotions, either in a either reacting to child's emotions and in a dismissing way, I need your feelings to go away right now because they make me feel panicky, they make me feel uncomfortable, or who are used to reacting to their own emotions in a, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but in a way that um, that is either kind of freely feeling whatever they want. I can't believe you are going off about this. We had a delicious brownie last night. That's reacting to my own emotions, right? So this is, this is tough because I'm having to acknowledge my own feelings, but then really first validate her feelings. Number three, reinforce limits and boundaries. There is needs to always be a boundary between needs and wants. And as far as this talk is concerned, and I'm sure we could argue this, food, water, shelter, and comfort are needs. A brownie for breakfast is a want. So you can comfort your child through not getting what they want. You can provide a need for them and meet the need of comfort without giving her what she wants. And so I think that's where people get kind of mixed up with the namby pambiness of this is they think emotion coaching, you feel sad, here's your brownie. She's not getting a brownie. That's been established. I, I, I set the limit, I'm reinforcing the limit. Um, let's take a break because you're saying some things that are hurting my feelings. And that's again, a, a thing that I think may be weird for people to hear a parent telling their child, but it's really important for kids to learn that sometimes the things that, that they say have an impact on other people. The things you said are hurting my feelings that you want to kick me out and go live on an island. And I know that you don't mean them. Can I give you a hug? Can we take some deep breaths together? So I'm offering some ways to calm down in the moment. I'm offering some ways to help her reduce the overload of emotions so that we can problem solve. You're not ever going to be able to problem solve when a child is screaming at you. It's not going to happen. Um, this is, my husband's an engineer. This can be really hard for him. He's very logical. And so for him, it's very much, well, let's do this and then we'll do this and you'll have a breath. And she's, we're not there right now. We're in, we're in anger city, rage USA. Like it's where we need to be is calming and soothing. And then we can get to problem solving. This is a tip that I stuck in here because I've said it to a few people and then people always come back and say, this has been an incredible tip for kind of keeping your cool in these moments. Always count to five in your head silently after asking your child something before repeating. Their brains work more slowly than ours. They are working as fast as they can to put together what you said and figure out how to respond. Let's give them that time. I, I, I catch myself sometimes asking her a question, you know, what shoes do you want to wear? And then wanting to go, what shoes do you want to wear? I know you want to wear shoes. If you count to five, you can almost see them working through it. Number four, problem solving. Again, sometimes when we feel really mad and sad, we need that big hug and to take deep breaths. Being hungry also makes it easier for us to feel sad. Let's talk again about breakfast, but before we talk, why don't you pick out a yogurt to eat? So this is at the point where she has calmed down. Um, she has, she, for this, I wrote big hug. She rejected the hug, but she took the deep breaths. Um, let's talk about breakfast, but before we talk, why don't you pick out a yogurt to eat? And so we're going to problem solve, but I do need to decrease her emotional vulnerability before we problem solve by making her not so hungry. So I, I often joke that when she's really upset, I'm sitting there trying to squirt a yogurt in her mouth while she's talking. But this, I will say, was a really good day. And I thought it was a little disingenuous of me to put this example in today when the example I deleted was from a few weeks ago when we had the Pringles incident, which was basically carving copy of this. But instead of problem solving and suiting her, I turned to my husband and said, I'm going to go take a shower. Why don't you deal with this? So, and I say that to say that even as somebody who is immersed in this work all the time, I still get overwhelmed and I still need to tap out and I still need to take a break. The important thing is knowing when you need that. So again, be aware of the kid's emotions and your own reactions. Validate their feelings in words they can understand. Reinforce your limits and boundaries. 
and problem solving the child. Sometimes problem solving is negotiating. Um, she was not going to get a brownie for breakfast. At this point, she, I was going to throw away the brownies, but we talked a little bit. She's going to have one tonight after her sister goes down because she's a baby. She made a brownie. So this was really talking about emotions. I did want to bring a little bit in about discussing mental health concerns, just in case that's coming up for people. Um, I talked before about the, I mean, mental health issues are, are sky high right now. I mean, it's just, you're going to have to talk about depression with your kids the way you'll have to talk about how Susie down the street broke her leg. So I do want to talk a little bit about ways to bring that up that are developmentally appropriate. Oh, number one, be developmentally appropriate. So really, you, you know your child, you know what's appropriate. Um, you can see how they react to things. Um, I have a, a patient who has a young child um, and we kind of talked through um, one, of, one of her loved ones had a mental health crisis. And so we kind of talked through how to talk about it, what was appropriate to talk about, what was appropriate to share, and um, what was probably not as appropriate. And that's going to be different for every nine-year-old. It's, it's going to be based on what you think is best for your kid. Focus on what their main concerns are. Um, a lot of times, let's say you're talking about your own depression, that you've been having a hard time, you've been sleeping a lot more, maybe you're finally seeking care, and you're trying to figure out how to explain what's been going on to your kid. Um, focus on what their concerns are. So kids, a lot of times, they worry that they did something to make the parents act differently. So it can be really useful to talk to them about that. Um, they often worry about how this is going to impact their day-to-day -day life. And so that may feel a little selfish. Um, I think it is a joy that we can allow children to be selfish and to think, well, will you still be able to take me to school? Will you still come? Will I still get a birthday party this year? Um, just these kind of things where they're thinking about how is this going to impact my life? Older kids will kind of worry and wonder how, it, whether or not they may develop something similar. They know, they know that these things kind of run in families. And so they'll start to worry, well, am I depressed? Is this something that I'm going to experience? Um, what can I do if I need to talk to somebody? talk with them the way they feel the most comfortable. Um, so we, I don't know what the ages are of people on this, you know, we got 27 people in here. Um, but a lot of us, like for me, I'm a elder millennial. Um, cell phones came in when I was like 15, 16. And um, so we have that kind of, what do they call it? We're not digital natives. Our kids are mostly digital native, natives. So they grew up with phones. So many of them, the most way, the way they're most comfortable talking about difficult subjects are on their phone. Um, if that's too far for you, if texting about this tough stuff is too hard, then consider doing it in the car or just even just sitting side by side, like working on a puzzle or something. Um, face to face is a way that some of us older folks like to have conversations, but that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Offer opportunities to talk recognize that just because you're ready to talk about it right then, they may not be. So accept their efforts to talk when they come up and just be willing to do that, willing to tolerate that. And then tell them only as much as you would feel comfortable having them tell their friends. And this is a tough one for a lot of people, especially for people who come from a background, whether culturally or emotionally or whatever it is, where family issues stay within the family. And that uh, again, I understand it. I think there's there's a lot of fear that can come up about like people outside of the family knowing things that may hurt the family standing or reputation, things like that. What we need to understand now is how social support is the number one most important factor for resilience across the board from traumas, from difficult times in the pandemic, it, whatever it may be. And so we need to make sure that kids feel like they can access their social support and use them to help them through difficult times. So um, I really caution against saying, you know, <laughs> mom's dealing with a really hard time and you can't talk about it with any of your friends. Um, I Just think through what you might feel comfortable having their friends know and let them know they're allowed to do that. So to wrap up, um, I hope I've been convincing that there are major benefits to discussing emotions. Um, there are benefits to understanding the different pieces of emotionality, uh, thinking through where you fall on each of those on each of those dimensions um, and where that might have come from. This is especially important post pandemic. Um, we have been. I, I, I talk a lot about how living through the pandemic has been 
akin to putting on a backpack filled with bricks and trying to just live your normal life. And because people come to me, must say, you know, I have no idea why I'm so anxious, why, why I'm having such a hard time. Almost, people must forget how difficult the pandemic has been in, in major earth shaking ways. Um, and then um, I provided some, I'm calling them simple, but not always easy techniques to practice. Um, these are, they can help provide a framework for managing your own emotions while helping children work through theirs. And that's a really important piece of this is it's just tolerating kind of across the board. So just overall helping kids talk about their emotions by modeling it for them and also helping them work through theirs can lead to immense benefits for you and your child and your family. So here's a couple of really good books I would think about getting, um, if I wanted to learn more. Both of these you can also Google and they have a lot of good information just on their website about what I've talked about today. And that's what I have. Thanks so much, Dr. <laughs> War. This was a very good presentation. Um, the only questions that have been posted that thus far um, are tied to the availability of the um, recording. And yes, uh, the Dr. Rohr has agreed to share her slides and she'll be emailing them to me and we will get them out to you along with the recording uh, later in the week. Um, it, it takes a little bit of cleanup to, to get the recording ready to send out, but we'll send you all a link and then it will also be on the Hope and Healing Center website. Uh, Dr. Rohr, if you'll take your slides down, then we can- Oh, sure. Can, um pipe in if they have any questions they want to ask <clears throat> okay if you um if you have a question um please turn on your screen and your microphone and make yourself known if you would be so kind Does that mean there aren't any questions? And Dr. Rohr was so complete with everything. It's a that... very thorough explanation. <laughs> hey, I thought it was very thorough, but it's been a long time since I've been a mom of a small kid. <laughs> I was going to say, I do actually have a question, if that's okay. I'll just By all in. means, please do. <laughs> so I have definitely tried the, the steps that you mentioned to kind of get my child calmed down to then be able to have that conversation about emotions offered the hug, offered the breaths. What if they refuse every ounce of help you're trying to offer and they just need to like get it out of their system? Like what, so, what do you do? <laughs> okay, so that's super, um, again, a little disingenuous for me to set, show such a, just an amazing example of how I emotion coached my child um, when that actually happens quite a bit more. And so there is a, um, there's a couple of things. One is, and I was trying to figure out at the end how to weave this in, so I'm glad you asked, but th there's an onus of responsibility on us as parents to tolerate the big emotions and to sit with them and say, I'm gonna sit with you until this does, because it will reach a peak, it has to. Um, I am also a big fan of taking a break, which may look a lot like a timeout, but there's a couple of different, <laughs> different things here. One is we name the emotion, the taking a break is up to her when she feels like coming out. And I will sit with her if she needs to, if she is just not calming down. I especially do this if she's starting to be kind of violent or aggressive, like she wants to throw things or hit stuff or whatever. Um, so her room is completely childproof. Like she can't hurt herself in there. There's books and stuff. And so to me, what that acts as, it's not a punishment. She's not being isolated because of her anger. It is a break from the stimuli of the situation. We need to remove ourselves from the stimuli of the situation. And then we can get to a place where we calm down. Um, other people use things like, um, I've seen people use weighted blankets, like pure sensory calming things. Um, can we go wash our hands and face real quick together? Um, some kind of sensory stimulation that's going to just distract from the overwhelm of the, but it's super important to always name the emotions first. And it sounds like a silly, small piece, but if you just say, oh, you're okay, you're being too loud. Let's go wash your face versus you're feeling really angry and upset. Let's go wash your face. Let's go get a cold drink. Let's go sit under the weighted blanket together. Um, sometimes it does take some trial and error to 
know what is going to help them come back down. And yeah, usually the deep breath is, I mean, there, there are times when it's great, but that can be replaced with any number of soothing techniques or grounding techniques um, that you kind of have to work with. How old is he? So it, he's almost five in December, but it always, I feel like tends to happen when we have somewhere we need to be, right? Absolutely. So I don't have the time to do that 15, 20 minute, let's calm down, let's take breaths, let's do the thing. And it's probably his anxiety, right? Like we're in a hurry, we're rushed. Um, but you try everything and it's just like, okay, we're just going to sit here and scream and we're going to be late to everything we go to. So there's <laughs> two things I would say to that. One is now you know that before you leave, you're probably going to have a meltdown. So can you start, is there something different you can do there? But two, it's important to do this most of the time. And so if there are some times when you just got to chuck them under your arm and shove them in the car seat, sometimes you just got to do it. And you, and you can say, you're angry. This has to happen right now. We can talk through how this makes you feel bad. I don't like it either. This is what has to happen. And that's, that's again, that's the repair piece. We can't, we can't be perfect all the time. And they have to learn that there are some consequences sometimes when we can't calm down. And that's like, I can't be in a meeting and start screaming and yelling. Like it's not always going to be appropriate for me to just lose my space. So it's that there are just some times when you just got to do it. And, and, but again, the repair part and talking through why it's happening is really important because I imagine, again, I've always noticed because I've had to do it too. Once there, she's, she's five in December too. Once she's strapped in and the pressure is there, there's a sensory bit where they calm down and then they're not facing you. And then you can talk through what happened. That, that was really, you felt really mad and you were really anxious. And I think that's what was happening. And I had to push it. I didn't like doing that, but then you just repair from there. Alyssa, you have a question. Would you unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you for this great presentation. And um, um, the tips were extremely great. Um, but my question is, um, I'm assuming that these same uh tips, if you will, um, and suggestions would work for teenagers and possibly even young adults. But is there anything that you think um, would be different that would be needed for a teenager or even a young adult to help I, them? Go ahead. Oh, no, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I guess I kind of have to, to minds there. One is that I have adults who don't know what they're like grown ass. sorry for my language, grown adults. Right, 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 right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> who have successful in business and, and don't, can't tell you what they're feeling at any given moment. Mm -hmm. So I do think that, that these can be useful for anybody. Something that I would do a little bit differently with teenagers and young adults is rather than offering so many, um, soothing techniques, Mm -hmm. uh, work with them ahead of time to determine their own. When you get stressed out, we call it coping ahead. When you get stressed out, what are things that make you feel better? And that way in the moment, you're helping them learn that I'm not always going to be here to tell you that you need to go um, take deep breaths by yourself. So learning to, to generate and kind of access those in that moment. Like as an adult, when I have high emotions, I have to think for myself with what I'm going to do to soothe them. So that's something that's a little bit different for teenagers and young adults is helping them to get there. And so having those conversations ahead of time or even after like, man, you were really upset about that. What do you think would have helped in the moment? Let's, let's kind of think through so that next time it won't be so hard to think of. Okay. Thank you. Cause I, I think what I'm finding is with some of the individuals that I work with, they just want, especially teenagers and young adults, they just want to express themselves, but then they don't want to hear the solutions. They don't want to be coached. They just want to vent and it goes mm -hmm. nowhere. And so that's yeah. my struggle with them wanting to be heard, but then that's all they want to do is just be heard, which right. I get, but you know, and <laughs> <laughs> in a rumination and they're just making it worse. And so, yes. mm -hmm. so helping to see the kind of impact of that and then helping them um, think about their own self-soothing in those moments, I think could be okay. helpful. All right, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? We're about out of time. I wanted to uh, note to Dr. Rohr some of the very 
kind compliments that have been placed in this oh, uh, chat. Uh, one person says this was awesome. So many relevant, important things to discuss with pa parent, uh, with patient. Sorry. Um, it works. Uh, I work at a sixth through twelfth grade charter school. Um, another thank you. Uh, this was very helpful, not just for relating to my adult children and grandchildren, mm -hmm. but even to better understand my own feelings and reactions. Uh, lots of really great information. Um, so thank you so much. For, this was incredibly helpful, and I would love to share this presentation with my husband. Oh, great. <laughs> so... Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, Dr. Rohr is sharing her slides. We will get the recording out to you. Please be patient with us uh, at the Hope and Healing Center. This is the beginning of the season. They're like with all of you, there's a lot going on. Um, please uh, take a look at our next month's. We actually have a program tomorrow uh, from our CARES department on navigating a hospital stay with an elder. So um, if you have time at noon tomorrow, please join us for that. And thank you again, Dr. War. This was spectacular and a great start to our new season. Thank you, guys. Everyone have a blessed day. Thank you.